Uh, tonight we're talking about attracting pollinators to our gardens. And the reasons we want to do that, and a few things about pollinators that we might find interesting or useful in the garden. And uh, this is going to have a little bit different orientation than perhaps you might expect, because we're not going to talk much about honeybees. We'll talk some about honeybees. But we're very concerned about native bees. And uh, hopefully, as the presentation goes on, you'll see why. Okay, this is an eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly, a very beautiful butterfly on a native shrub, which uh, is, is a button bush, which you find in moist areas or wet areas. I had it growing in a pond, in a pot. And uh, this, is, this is what came to it. So, <clears throat> very attractive to this particular butterfly. Because why? Because it has something the butterfly wants, right? So why are pollinators important in our gardens? Well, we all know that they pollinate a lot of our food crops. Squashes and cucumbers and melons and berries and beans, eggplants, anything that has a fruit on it, and we're seeking to eat the fruit, when the plant flowers, there have to be pollinators there to transfer the pollen to the appropriate part of the flower for fertilization to take place. And then the fruit grows, and what is the fruit? The fruit is like an enlarged ovary, right? So that's, that requires pollination from some sort of pollinator. Now, pollinators very often uh, help control pests in the garden. So the more insects and the more pollinators we can bring into our garden, there will actually be an ecosystem established there among the insects, and a lot of the undesirable bugs uh, will get controlled or limited by some of the other bugs. And uh, some of you, I'm sure, know some of these uh, dynamics already. Can you name some uh, where insects eat insects here that you see in your garden? Ladybugs eating aphids. All right, very common one, right. How about something else? Praying mantis. Praying mantis, yeah, yeah. Eating other bugs? Carnivorous wasps. Carnivorous wasps, okay. How about, uh, have you ever seen a big caterpillar in a, in a garden with all uh, white eggs on it? Yeah, there are wasps or that lay eggs on like the tomato hornworm, which is a, a big uh, pest of uh, tomato plants. And uh, those eggs will hatch and will devour the tomato hornworm from the inside out. So, all right. Now, as I mentioned, uh, seed production. If you want seed from the plants that you have in your garden, no matter what type of plants, whether they're flowers or vegetables and so forth, the flowers on that, you must allow that plant to go to flower and then it has to be pollinated. So seed production, totally dependent on pollination. Uh, now, natural plant communities. Are there a lot of plants out in our uh, natural preserves? that fruit, that flower and fruit, they require pollination. And for those communities to stay healthy, there have to be a lot of wild pollinators around. <coughs> native bees, all of the native insects, have to be active in the ecosystem. They're an essential part of the whole environmental uh, integrity, if you will. Right? Now, and when you start gardening for, uh, with pollinators in mind in your yard, the pleasure that uh, watching these insects and the entertainment you can derive from watching the insects is, is enormous. It's really a lot of fun. I was never into insects until I got one particular native plant, which uh, <clears throat> we have back there tonight, called dotted horsemint, which actually goes wild down at Fort DeSoto. I have flowers in August and September, and when it flowers, the diversity of insects around it is phenomenal. 
the, and the activity is, is just crazy. So I, I can go out and stand there for five or ten minutes and just, it's, it's better than watching TV, that's for sure. <laughs> what, what is that place? Dotted Horsemint. Thank you. Okay. It's a, it's a bee balm. You heard of bee balm, right? Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's in the mint family, square stems, opposite leaves. Uh, but it, it's native to Florida. It has really pretty flowers that are actually excellent cut flowers, too. And, uh, but must contain a tremendous amount of nectar because the insects that come through it are all sorts of different uh, insects. All right, so those are the reasons why pollinators are important. All right, what are the pollinators? Who's doing the pollinating out there? Well, this is a list. Bats, bees, beetles, birds, butterflies, a lot of bees, flies, moths, wasps, and hornets, and the wind. So let's deal with a few of these uh, in general terms. Uh, that's a nice native flower there in the picture. That's deer tongue with a bumblebee on it. Uh, <clears throat> the wind, uh, what, uh, what does the wind pollinate? Any grasses, any of the grass family plants, right? So that's why grasses don't have beautiful flowers. They don't need to. Plants have beautiful flowers in order to attract pollinators. So when the wind uh, does the pollinating, for example, uh, very often corn is pollinated by wind. It's part of the grass family, right? Uh, so uh, moths, uh, they're active at night. In, during the day? Yeah. Sometimes. Sometimes. Okay, in the shady areas. Okay. All right. Uh, flies, uh, from what I understand, are active as pollinators in shady areas or moist areas. What areas? Uh, they're not a major one for us to consider tonight. Uh, bats. Bats are active in the southwest. They're not really considered an important pollinator in this area, but out in the southwest, uh, they pollinate cactus and agave. And, of course, they're active at night. So beetles are active around here as pollinators. Uh, from what I understand, they're not very efficient pollinators. They're very clumsy, they're very awkward. They spill pollen and so forth, but they do some pollination. Uh, so, the important ones here are bees, butterflies, and the wasps and hornets, and that's what we'll be talking a lot about tonight. Now, uh, the birds, uh, what bird do you think does most of the time? Hummingbirds. Why, yeah, that's right, exactly. More so than other birds. And why is that? Hmm? They feed on nectar, and they have a lot of they insert their their bill into the flower, right? Good, excellent, right? Okay. So we mentioned so in we have lots of different types of pollinators that we just mentioned, but the main pollinators are insect pollinators, and that's what we're concerned about here tonight. These are love bugs here, which are actually a te technically a fly on a beautiful uh, native shrub called Simpson stopper, a uh, wonderful plant. Now, what attracts pollinators? Well, for flies, very often it's odor, you know. And uh, if you dump some stuff in the compost pile, immediately, you know, you'll find some flies around, right? So they have, obviously, a very good sense of smell, and that draws them. But uh, for a lot of other pollinators, color or nectar guides, nectar guides are actually patterns on flowers which are designed to draw the pollinator into the center of the flower, to, in a sense, they're signposts for nectar, you know, nectar this way, you know. Uh, fragrance. The shape of the flower is important. Um, tubular flowers, not all, all pollinators will go into tubular flowers, right? 
but uh, what will go to tubular flowers? Hummingbirds, especially, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, the amount of nectar or pollen in the flower is also uh, an attractant. If, if a flower has a lot of nectar or a lot of pollen, then it becomes a, a target for uh, the pollinators. And the time of day the flower opens, uh, most of the pollinators, I understand, are, are very active in the morning, and it kind of tapers off as the day wears on. So, uh, Black swallowtail on pickerelweed. You all know what pickerelweed is? That's an aquatic, freshwater aquatic. It grows along the edges of ponds and flowers that beautiful, that beautiful purple flower. What are pollinators after? What are they seeking? Well, obviously nectar, and you see that uh, nectar provides carbohydrates, sugar, and amino acids. And then the pollen provides protein, fats, and the bees in their combs use uh, the pollen for larval food. <clears throat> All right, we'll just mention a little bit about honeybees here tonight, but this is not the main focus of the talk. Uh, this is obviously pictures from commercial, kind of industrial beekeeping to complement industrial agriculture. And these uh, hives are moved all around the country. Uh, major crisis now, of course, uh, I'm sure you've all heard, uh, Colony collapse disorder, which is attributable to mainly pesticides, neonics. Uh, and I was just reading a piece uh, online yesterday. Not only are these problem chemicals in agriculture, uh, some institution did a test on the uh, landscape plants from Home Depot, Lowe's, I think one other place, Walmart, was they found neonics on those plants. And it takes years for that stuff to, to wear away. So anybody who's buying plants from these big commercial establishments is bringing that stuff home. And that stuff is, remains active on these plants for a long time, and if pollinators come to those plants, they have attractive flowers, they could, they could be in trouble. All right, so we're, with this presentation tonight, we're looking to dialogue, to converse somewhat about native bees and native plants. And my background, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in pollination. I'm not a... I'm not an entomologist or uh, a professional uh, concerned with uh, pollination. However, I do have very good experience, as Ray mentioned, with native plants. And uh, native plants and native insects and native pollinators go together because they co-evolve together. And uh, so it's a wonderful combination. So there are at least 200 species of native uh, bees in the state of Florida. And from one source that I read, and I wasn't able to verify that, this source said that native bee species are 80 times more effective as pollinators than honeybees. I can't vouch for that. But that was a very, very interesting statement. Uh, why that is, I'm not sure. Uh, but it would be, uh, be interesting to explore that some more. Uh, many of the native bees are solitary. And because they're solitary, they're not aggressive as some col uh, colony uh, uh, bees are. Uh, colonial bees, for example, uh, honeybees, uh, I mean, bumblebees, not honeybees, but honeybees as well. 70% of the native bees live in the ground. They nest in the ground. And then there are stem nesters, the ones listed here, carpenter, mason, and stem cutter bees. They actually live in the stems of plants. Some bees live in trees. You've seen that, I'm sure. But most live in the ground. 
There's a little native bee that was from my yard on a, a bloodberry, which is a native shrub. All right, butterflies. Uh, butterflies will f are very democratic in their feeding. When they are nectaring, they'll take uh, nectar from any plants available at the time that have good nectar source. So they're very democratic. But when it comes to laying their eggs, they are extremely fussy and extremely specific about the species they lay their eggs on. And uh, there's a reason for that. They know that there's going to be a good food source for the larva, the caterpillar, when the, uh, after the hatch has taken place. Right? So there's a long historical relationship. I mentioned coevolution. Native plants and butterflies, or pollinating insects, have coevolved through eons. So they know which plants to lay, they want to lay their eggs on. Uh, so examples of the specificity about their egg laying, Gulf fritillary, which is a very common orange butterfly here, I'm sure you all have seen it, uh, it lays its eggs on passion vine, any of the passion vines. And there are a number of native passion vines, there are also some non-native passion vines. Uh, monarch butterflies, most people know that uh, they'll lay on uh, milkweed. Right? And uh, parsley also. So, and the sulfurs, which are the yellow butterflies, they are very attracted to cassias of different types. Uh, there are native cassias and there are non-native cassias. So why native plants? I mentioned it a couple times already because of the long association uh, of insect pollinators and native plants. All right, let's look a little bit at the insect life cycle. So we have the four stages of life, the egg and the larva. And the larva is usually uh, particularly of a, a moth or a butterfly. It's usually what? A caterpillar, right? And then you, it goes into the pupal stage, which you see on the top right, the, uh, the chrysalis is formed. And then you have a time-lapse photography there of different stages of the development of the chrysalis until you have the adult. So we have on the bottom, the bottom we have the, uh, the Gulf fritillary caterpillar, the larva. And if you look closely in the lower left-hand corner, you can see a lot of damage from the caterpillar. That's fine. And then on the right, the sulfur on a native shrub called Bahama cassia. So, <clears throat> if, if we're going to support native pollinators in our yard, we have to know something about the habitat needs of these pollinators. So, <clears throat> what is habitat? Can somebody give us a definition of habitat? Okay. It's wherever an organism can find food, shelter, and water, and they generally live there, right? That's called their habitat, right? Okay, so that can apply to any kind of biological organism. So, the adults, the adult pollinators need uh, nectar and pollen. We've discussed that. And the caterpillars obviously need plants that are suitable to them. We call that larval host plants. The larval are being hosted by these specific plants. They need clean, shallow water. And if you have a bird bath, uh, uh, you know, don't expect uh, uh, insects or uh, butterflies and stuff to get their water from that, right? And if you do have a bird bath, keep it clean. But uh, very often, uh, butterflies will uh, get water or minerals from wet soil or even from dung. 
Uh, and they also need shelter, which is also called cover. Right? They need uh, they need protection from the weather, and they need protection from predators. So, uh, a diversity of plant material in the yard will provide that. Trees, shrubs, perennials, plants that grow at different levels of the, of the uh, property. And uh, cover will also provide them places to roost where they can sleep and places to nest. So if you're interested in, uh, in providing habitat, then these, these are considerations you really should think about a little bit. Where are the pollinators that you're looking to attract? Where are they going to get water? Where are they going to uh, shelter? Yes, Rita. Yeah, well, unless you, you know, different different species would have different needs, but they have to, most water features in people's yards. No, that even that deep is, is deep. If the sides are straight, if the sides are sloping, they can access the water. They kind of walk. Yeah, they kind of walk. Yeah, like the beach, exactly, right? So that's easy. But if you have a dish, like say a bird bath or something, if you want to put a rock in it so that they can land on it and access the surface of the water easily like that, that might work. You know? But uh, yeah, most landscape water features, the sides are straight and the water is deep, and it's difficult even for many birds to approach and make use of that water feature. Right? So shallow is the key to supporting wildlife in terms of water. All right, flowers, native wildflowers, really tremendous variety of uh, native flowers, beautiful uh, Florida native wildflowers. And we have a lot of them here in the back uh, tonight for you to, uh, to take if you like uh, for a donation. And uh, first one is rosin weed that gets, uh, gets four to five feet tall, with absolutely gorgeous uh, daisies on it. Uh, I like this plant so much, I use this uh, picture on my business card. Uh, the partridge pea in the middle is an uh, extremely tough uh, plant. It's an annual, but it will grow in the hottest, driest places. It's very pretty. It's a nitrogen fixer, so it's in the pea and bean, fa bean family. So it has many qualities, and it just... Uh, just takes care of itself. It naturalizes pretty freely in, in my yard. And then the dotted horse mint on the right, I mentioned that. I don't think I've ever seen a plant that draws so many insects. That's really an incredible pollinator attractor. It blooms in August and September. So is that a benefit to you or not? No. But it is a, a, a beautiful plant. Uh, it grows very readily in hot, dry areas. Uh, it reseeds very freely. Most of these wildflowers will reseed very freely, which will require some management. Uh, but uh, you'll, you'll have more than enough plants, I assure you. Uh, ironweed is a beautiful complement to rosinweed because it's purple and uh, it grows about the same height as rosinweed. They go beautifully together. Um, and then uh, scarlet hibiscus, uh, that's a, uh, a plant that likes water. So I grow it in a pot, in a small pond, and it's just started flowering this past week. The flowers are this big, and they're that color. Just absolutely spectacular. And every, in the beginning of every summer, I can't wait for those things to bloom. It's just, just wonderful. And then there's a nice little landscape there with some uh, blanket flower, which is 
a coastal plant, it grows right out here on our coast, right here. Uh, Gallardia, it's also known as. And uh, uh, Black-Eyed Susan, which is a Rudbeckia. Uh, so you can get, uh, these things, once they get started in your yard, they're just naturalized and uh, they can cover a lot of ground, yes. 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 I, yeah, in a three gallon pot. Yeah, and it'll grow for a few years in there and then I shift it up to a, se a seven gallon pot. We have two of them at the Faith House Garden in the pond. And uh, one had started to bloom already. What's that? Well, it will grow in wet soil, moist soil. It's certainly not a dry site plant. But if you have a moist area, if you have a, a, a swale someplace that generally stays moister than the rest of the landscape, it might be worth a try there. Or if you have a pond or a water feature, put it in a pot, it's just spectacular. The top dies down every year. I cut down the stem, and, but it comes back from the roots the next spring. Beautiful plant. And here are some native trees and shrubs. Uh, just absolutely beautiful plants. Uh, look in the, in the middle there you see a, a monarch butterfly nectaring on the flatwoods plum. Flatwoods plum, right. And then there's a Chickasaw plum in the lower left hand, spectacular in flower. That, that plant suckers a lot, though. You have to be careful where you put that. And Walter's viburnum is, to me, when that flowers, that's the beginning of spring, because it usually is uh, late February, early March that it flowers. And look at the mass of flowers there. Marlberry, this picture down below, is one of my favorite plants. It's exquisite. Uh, you don't see flowers on it here because it's through, finished flowering and it has some young fruit on there, not fully developed, but spectacular flowers, white fragrant flowers, uh, followed by beautiful black fruit that the birds love and we can eat. So it's a wonderful plant. Um, the lower right is a, a saw palmetto. It's, it's a silver one. It mainly comes from the east coast of Florida. Uh, but the, the native palms, like the cabbage palm, which is our state tree, and the saw palmettos, uh, when they flower, the insects are just all over it. All over it. So I have a cabbage palm in my backyard right now that's flowering, and it's just loaded with insects. Uh, when I've done landscapes, I've always tried to include penthas. It's a non-native plant, but my gosh, it's, it's a very pretty plant. It lasts three or four years, and it is a great pollinator attractor, and it'll attract hummingbirds, too. So on the right there, that's a little native landscape in front of the Tampa Bay Regional Planning Council, uh, and I put some penthas in there. So I really have to acknowledge that plant. Yeah. And they said that the other hybrid plants are not nectar producing, and so those are not going to work with pollinators because of only the tall red ones. Right. The tall, the tall red ones are the ones to get. Right. Yeah. yeah. Now, they should be cut down to about a foot every year, but they, they should last. The ones that you saw there are, you know, they're about four years old. So that's, that's great. Uh, all of the herbs or that flower in your garden can attract pollinators. And I don't know if you've ever seen the monarch on, on parsley, but uh, they go for that. That's the monarch larvae. And on the right, the black swallowtail on fennel flower. So uh, dill, Parsley and fennel are great larval host plants for butterflies, certain species of butterflies. All right. 
Uh, a not to do list. Don't be a meticulous cleaner upper in the yard, in the garden, right? Because you just might be eliminating all the habitat, the, uh, the cover, the, the roosting places, or the nesting places for some of these pollinators. Don't pick up all the fallen fruit. Many of these pollinators feed on the fruit, including butterflies and uh, uh, other, other insects. Don't pull every weed. And I think it, it really pays to identify weeds that pollinators like. And then decide what you want to do with the weed. Right? The weed is a plant we haven't found a use for. So if it's providing a lot for pollinators and you want to attract pollinators in your yard, don't be in a hurry to take it out, right? So like uh, Spanish needles, for example, is uh, <clears throat> a very common weed with edible leaves and flowers, and it's got a ton of nectar in it, and a lot of pollinators come to it. I've seen a hummingbird at Fort DeSoto on a single Spanish needles flower for about a minute. I've never seen a hummingbird stay in one place for a minute. It's incredible. So obviously, it's a, it's a really good source, good source of uh, nectar. But you have to be careful with Spanish needles. Does everybody know what Spanish needles are? It's the uh, it's kind of the white flower with the yellow center. It can get up fairly tallish like this. It proliferates like crazy, and that's that's the problematic side of Spanish needles. It just is a very vigorous uh, propagator. And uh, <clears throat> don't rake up all the leaf litter. Find, find some areas in the garden where you can leave a little, a little bit more natural, right? Leave some leaf litter on the ground uh, or have some mulch. What's that? Is mulch, yes. <laughs> Yes, uh, that is can be used as mulch, certainly. And then uh, pesticides are a problem, obviously. And uh, uh, if you have an insect infestation, very often uh, you can deal with it with just a strong jet of water from the hose, or you can make a little uh, spray concoction of uh, some laundry or dish, dish soap and water with a little bit of vegetable oil in there. That's very good for aphids uh, or any insects that are sucking uh, from, the, from the plant. So uh, yeah, I think this is really a, a key point because the native pollinators are being affected by all of the pesticides being used that are killing honeybees. So, native pop, uh, bee populations and pollinator populations are also feeling the impact of all this pesticide use. Yes. Yeah. And certainly, if you have a pond, you want to put mosquito fish uh, in there. They're small fish that you can get in any any ditch, and uh, they they stay small and they eat mosquito larvae. Mosquito fish. Oh, Cam yes. What do you put in the blender? Spanish needle. With a little, okay. <laughs> All right. How can I get bee bags? Bee bags. Okay, things that you can do. <laughs> Have a minimum of lawn areas. Now we're talking, this is the context of these suggestions is of course supporting pollinators, right? 
particularly native pollinators. So have a minimum of lawn area. Lawn is not productive for any kind of wildlife. And it's not productive of food, right? So either plant food or, or some sort of native uh, species that will supp uh, support uh, pollinators. Uh, you just drive through the city, yard after yard after yard of just grass. It's uh, very unproductive and uh, not, not very interesting. That's right. That's right. Many millions of acres of lawns in the United States. Right. Uh, and then in place of all that grass, or at least some of that grass, you can have a diversity of plants in there to attract pollinators. Uh, when you plant flowers, perennials or annual flowers, plant in multiples of the same species. Don't just plant one you know, because when you attract pollinators, they want to be able to visit multiple entities of the same species. Uh, so and that's, that's, aesthetically, that's always a good practice anyway. Plant three or five or, or seven of something, you know, in a, in a cluster, in a grouping. Uh, if you can, leave snags. You know, you know where the snag is? Snag is a dead tree. And if it's not a safety hazard, uh, leave it because many things can uh, make use of a dead tree, right? From woodpeckers and uh, uh, some of the parrots nest in uh, some of these snags, but also some uh, pollinating insects, bees, uh, maybe some native bees can live in there. And uh, <clears throat> leave some open ground because remember what we said, 70% of the native bees nest in the ground. So uh, you might invite them to, uh, to nest there if you have some area of soil, bare soil. So uh, we mentioned identifying the weeds that support pollinators. That's important. And then you have to decide, you know, how much of those plants you're going to keep and, and, and use to support pollinators. And you really should accept some damage on some of these plants that are larval host plants. For example, milkweeds get really chewed up heavily by monarch caterpillars, right? So if that's an aesthetic problem, then maybe you can tuck the milkweed in behind some other plant that will disguise it, right? The milkweeds? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There are native milkweeds and there are non-native milkweeds. And the one that's most often sold in stores is, is non-native, but it functions very well with uh, the, uh, the monarch butterflies, and they certainly make good use of it. Uh, Have you heard of the What? Was that researched or was that just somebody's opinion? Uh huh. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> you can have a hive of honeybees if you want, and you really don't even have to buy the material. There are beekeepers out there looking for places to put hives, and they'll manage them, and uh, they'll share the honey with you. So, <clears throat> if that interests you, then that's a possibility. 
Uh, build a B block. Any, anybody ever done that? Yeah. You want to describe it, Ray? Yeah, the uh, solitary bees. Yes. Yeah. A bee block might be a very interesting little project with, uh, you know, a grammar school child or something. Uh, the video I saw was, uh, I haven't done it, but about an 18 piece, uh, 18 inch piece of four by four with three eighth inch holes dug, uh, drilled in there every inch and a half or so. And uh, what they did was uh, they drilled all the way through and then they put a thin backboard on it so that uh, when they went to clean it out, they could just take off the backboard and they could use something to poke through and clean out the holes. Right? So that was very interesting. Doctor, yes. You said about 12 feet up. I mean, is that the depth? Is it important to have that high off the ground? Probably depends on what type of bee you're going to use. Make it happen. It'll be worth a try. And I'm sure if you looked it up online, you could find a lot of information. Yeah. Yeah. So, first of all, it should not be pressure treated wood. Okay. <laughs> Until, I'm glad we didn't forget that, that little item here. Yes, of course. Yeah. Right. And uh, by the way, bees can't see red. They're red blind. So any red flowers are not pollinated by bees. Yeah. All right, uh, and the last item on the list here uh, that might be really interesting, I'm, I'm very interested in doing this, is to make a, a, uh, a flower calendar. In, in other words, Look in your yard and uh, keep a sheet of paper somewhere and record what plants are flowering at what time of the year. And the idea is that you develop this over the span of a year and you see where you have no flowers, the time of the year you have no flowers. Then you can look for flowers that would support pollinators at those times of the year when you have nothing uh, to offer them. So I, th I think, again, I think it would be a marvelous project with uh, uh, either a grammar school or even a high school student. Or that have what? Bloom? Bloomed all year round? Well, I'm sure there have been, there, we're constantly seeing changes uh, in, in uh, weather patterns and time of bloom. There's a whole new uh, science developed around this, uh, trying to figure out the changes that are happening to plants due to weather uh, patterns, right? Uh, what is it called? Phrenology? Is that the word? I thought that was the lump on your head. All right, what, no, it's, 
<laughs> Maybe that's not the term, but it's close to that. Like Diane, that. do you remember no. what it is? No. <laughs> it's not for. I have a couple of questions. Um, Surname Cherry, yes. are they blue? Are they very helpful in the Portuguese population? I don't know. Your, your which? Corn plant. Corn, the, yeah. The, uh, you know, the uh, farm, uh, what do they call it? Is it Zaxidia? Uh, they, they, uh, you've never seen them? They're, they're, they, they started out as big plants. We got a big garden like in this city that my husband put in the ground. And we have like 15 in our yard now. They're like 30 feet high. And they have one place that they'll put out a shoot off the side. It's really, really great. No. Uh, no. We also have coffee growing in our yard with flowers. What? Coffee. Wild coffee? Wild coffee. It is flowers and it's not pretty. Right. Beautiful native plant. And it, it goes in the polyester also? Well, any of these plants. Any uh, of these flowers are common. Any flowers are common. Yeah. And it, if they're going to make the fruit, and it makes a nice dark red fruit that the birds love. You know, it's got to be, it's got to be pollinated. So. Okay. So, uh, do you have any other questions or things before we talk about resources here? Uh, yes, uh, Todd. Phenology. Phenology. Yeah. Phenology, yes. Right, and how how and how plants respond to those weather pattern changes. Yeah. 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 All right. Here is uh, here's some interesting resources if you want to pursue this: the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, NAPPC.org. The Xerces Society, uh, they're all concerned with pollinators. The Pollinator Partnership, .org. NatureWise uh, has two uh, videos which are excellent. They were produced in Orlando by the native plant people there, and uh, specifically Tracy McCommon uh, did a fabulous job, and uh, they've appeared on TV. Uh, so. That, that's wonderful educational material there. And then there's a Selecting Plants for Pollinators. Uh, this was put together, it's an ex extensive listing of plants for the Southeast. It was put together by the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign and the Pollinator Partnership. Extremely detailed about uh, different plants that grow in the Southeast, what their colors are, what their bloom times are, what uh, insect pollinators will come to them and visit them. So that's, that's pretty extensive. It might be more than you, you want to look at, but if you're uh, very interested in this topic, I, would, I, I can send you the link for that or I can send you the file. And the book, uh, Forgotten Pollinators by uh, Stephen Buckman and Gary Nabon. Uh, I haven't read that, but I'm interested in taking a look at that book. Uh, they are they are two of the guys that first brought attention to our crisis with pollinators in the country. <coughs> yes, Ray. Bill, would you like to mention the book that you would recommend that we uh, talk about native plants and how big they get, what kind of bloom they get, <coughs> and what type of soil and light they require? You would recommend for uh, Well, one of my constant references is A Gardener's Guide for Florida Native Plants by uh, yeah, Rufino Osorio. He, uh, he's a great plantsman and uh, lives in, in southeast Florida. Huh? Did you read that title 
A Gardener's Guide for Florida Native Plants. Yeah. Yes. Would you like them to be? <laughs> would you send would you send me an email? Thank you. <laughs> so could you also tell us what plants specifically are back on the back table? Okay. Yes. We have rosin weed. Remember that beautiful yellow daisy I showed you? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, uh, the people who really know a lot about native <laughs> plants beside myself are Diane and, and Ray here. Okay. Uh, so we're all resources here, and we can help you uh, make selections or, or discuss how to plant these plants or how to care for them. All right, any more questions? Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, okay.